Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Kruger, and I'm uh, the department head in social science and policy studies in the School of Arts and Science Sciences. And on behalf of Dean, Dean Jean King of the School of Arts and Sciences, I'd like to welcome you to day two of our Social Justice Summit. Just to recap a little bit of what happened yesterday, uh, it was an exciting day of um, keynote presentation on uh, AI and um, mathematics and social justice. Uh, and then we had a wonderful storytelling event in the afternoon. And for those of you who missed it, um, I'm sorry, because um, you missed it, because it's not taped, it's not anywhere. But I can tell you, it, it reminds me of, um, Cornell West came to WPI last uh, spring, and he, somebody was, he was re re relating a story about uh, the blues and how people say they love the blues. And he said, you know, man, that's somebody's story. And uh, storytelling is a way for us to come together as a community, for us to understand through other people's eyes, uh, our own identities, our own connections to other people, love, uh, loss. And we heard all those things yesterday from uh, our very brave and talented colleagues. So I wanna thank them for that wonderful uh, expression. Thank you. So as I look to the panel to my left, um, high bar, <laughs> and I'm sure you'll, be, you'll meet it. Um, so as I said, again, welcome to day two. We have a wonderful uh, agenda for you, uh, starting with a keynote speech um, from the Dean of our Global School, who will uh, be introduced in a moment, as well as a, a round table on pedagogy following that. Uh, hope to see you uh, in a YouTube space or a Zoom room or in this room soon. Thanks very much for coming. Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I'm Lorene Elgert, and I'm here to um, welcome our keynote speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to, to introduce Dr. Mimi Scheller, who, as you've heard a multitude of times, I'm sure by now, she's the inaugural dean of WPI's Global School. Um, dean Scheller is a pioneer in the area of mobilities research, and she's the founding editor of the journal Mobilities. The framework of mobilities has had an immeasurable impact on the social sciences bringing to bear an essentially global, dynamic, and critical perspective to the huge range of work on migration, transportation, um, um, culture, science and technology, gender, public policy, and really the list goes on. Um, mobilities research, and more specifically, mobilities justice, has, illuminated, has really illuminated the ways in which social and spatial and geographical mobility and importantly, immobility, is gendered, racialized, and class-based. The relevance and importance of this approach only grows along with the demands of, the, of global problem solvers. So understanding and coming to terms with the politics of mobility and immobility becomes increasingly urgent as we watch the unfolding of multiple global refugee crises of violent borders from Syria to Afghanistan to the American South, who is welcomed and who's beaten back. Understanding the climate crisis and the challenge of just decarbonization is more and less effectively addressed through policies and programs that, have, that travel within and between scales, from person to person, from place to place, and from the global to local, and have political and economic implications in addition to environmental implications. Social and economic inequalities have grown to the highest levels in decades and have been exacerbated by the global pandemic, yet opportunity and social mobility seems to, seems to remain a low priority in public policy. And this has a disproportionate impact on women and people of color. Mobilities even regards the politics of scale and what comes to be considered local and global based on what rationale and who has the power and authority to decide. So to offer us four perspectives on mobility, 
We are also privileged to welcome faculty from across WPI's campus. We have Shams Bada from Electrical and Computer Engineering and Jennifer DeWinter from Humanities and Arts. And they will offer some insights into their collaborative work on transportation and access to healthcare. We have John Galante from Humanities and Arts, and he'll discuss his work on mobilities and the meaning of Latinness in, in the Americas. Andy Trapp from Business and Jerry Dimas from the Data Science Program will present their work on immigration courts and da data analytics. And Catherine Fu from the Department of Integrative and Global Studies will discuss her work on policy mobilities and urban sustainability. Um, I see I've advanced your slides already, I apologize. So um, without further ado, I uh, cede the, the podium to Mimi for our keynote speech. Thank you. Thanks, Mimi. Thank you, Laureen, for that wonderful introduction to not just myself, but to the field of mobilities research. I'm so delighted to be here and so happy to find colleagues who are also interested in mobilities, immobilities, and social justice, crucially. And the turn in my own work has been towards mobilities justice. And you might wonder, why is that plural, right? Why, my, I have a book called Mobility Justice. This talk is called Mobilities Justice in part to capture the multiple different kinds of mobilities that the field is concerned with, that our research is concerned with, everything from human mobilities to data and informational mobilities to uh, policy mobilities, right? So it's plural to capture those multiple meanings when we talk about mobilities. Um, yesterday, there was a wonderful keynote address also by Meredith Broussard on artificial intelligence which also raises some really interesting issues about how new technologies intersect with our mobilities of different, in different ways. And that's one of the areas that this field has been concerned with from the beginning, is data and informational mobilities and their relation to physical mobilities and freedom of movement, surveillance, um, all of those issues. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to the field very briefly. Then I'm going to talk about the concept of mobility justice and what it means. And then I want to talk about social movements that have organized around mobility justice and really brought the social justice is issues to the foreground. So first, introducing a growing interdisciplinary field. These are some of the publications that um, kind of you know, and there's you know, dozens and dozens of others, but for me, that it's just a representation of this very vibrant, very lively global field that began about uh, 15 to 20 years ago and um, was picking up on currents that already existed. For example, in anthropology, there had long been the study of transnationalism and diaspora and field research at multiple sites, uh, traveling theory. In my own work in Caribbean studies, there's a deep and long interest in mobilities of the Caribbean region that created the region and that still inform it. And then, of course, in the European context, um, at this particular period around 15 to 20 years ago, there was a lot of discussion around globalization and um, you know, the idea of flows and borders were uh, of great concern as the European Union was forming the Schengen space, questions about migration. So all of that was happening and we were very interested in kind of drawing on those currents and really talking about the inequalities and the power structures that govern mobilities and immobilities and that those are always relational. That it, mobility is not just a question of freedom and movement and more is better, but that it's always relational. Mobility is entangled with immobility in many different ways. And that's what I'll talk about a little bit today. And as you can see here, there interests, um, there's the journal Mobilities, as well as a journal called Applied Mobilities, a journal called Transfers, Interdisciplinary <coughs> Journal of Mobility Studies, um, a number of texts that have tried to define the field, and it ranges from things like aero mobilities, right, the, the air space as a space of uneven and unequal mobilities, cargo mobilities, for example, looking at logistics and the way in which cargo moves around the world, and also waste and, you know, the, the outcomes of all of that movement of cargo, which, of course, is such a 
you know, present issue in everyone's minds right now, I think, because of the sort of log jam that's happening in the logistics system for the delivery of goods. Um, and we're seeing, you know, like the UK, for example, has had this shortage um, of petrol and of other consumer goods. We see ships piling up at our ports um, in California. So that's part of it. Mobile Lives, which is a book about the way in which people live mobile lives. Both what I call the kinetic elite, those who have high mobility, and also those who have um, kind of uncomfortable, like forced mobilities or con very constrained mobilities. People uh, ex experiencing displacement, temporary work, um, short uh, contract work, those also are different kinds of mobile lives. Um, so let me just move on to just what, I'll also introduce the idea that there's a global mobilities research network. And there's numerous um, conferences and events. These ones date back to 2010 and 2011 um, when I was organizing a center for mobilities research at Drexel University and bringing this global field kind of into the U.S. context where it has uh, arrived sort of later than it did in other, other places and thinking about um, differential mobilities, that was a conference here, uneven mobilities that was uh, held at uh, University of Santiago de Chile, um, the Cosmobilities Network, the Mobile Lives Forum, which is based in France, which has a great website if you look for that work. So a really lively interdisciplinary and global field. So what is mobility justice? That's our topic today. And what's its relationship to social justice? And I want to just describe briefly this, um, the themes of my book, which is on the politics of movement. And so oh, another way to say that is kinopolitics, right? The politics of movement, how movement is political. So thinking kinopolitically is a way to think about how mobility is about power, politics, inequality, struggles over it. So power and inequality are embedded in the governance and control of all forms of immobility, mobility, and dwelling. And you'll notice I put immobility, mobility with parentheses, and that's to capture that idea that they're always relational, they're always entangled. Um, dominant mobility regimes are premised upon differential immobilities, mobilities, and uneven access to mobility space. So if you think about some person's freedom to move. Um, you could go back to American history, right? The idea of the frontier, the westward movement, uh, settlement, right? Settler colonies were about moving, but of course they were displacing native peoples, right? And they were also imposing certain kinds of infrastructures on the landscape, um, including fences, for example. So it's that kind of thinking of that relationship. And then unequal motility, and motility is a word that comes from, some of you scientists probably recognize it from studying cells or things like that and, and single cell organisms, but it, 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 in its most basic form, it means the potential for mobility. And unequal motility is productive of differences of race, gender, class, ageability. So think about that. It's not just that people of different genders or ages or abilities have different types of movement. It's that the unequalness of the world we have built produces racialized, gendered, classed, aged, disabling differences in who can access, who can move, who, so think about the kind of clothing that women historically have worn that limited their mobility. Think about racialized spaces that limit who can enter them, who can be in them, that create the, the color line, as W.B. E. B. Du Bois called it, that create the, the racial boundary itself. Um, and think about disabling spaces, right, that don't have universal accessibility so that people with different capabilities for movement cannot always, you know, come up a staircase, for example. So those unequal motilities um, are making um, these, this world of differential mobilities, and that's performative. It's scripted into our spatial relations and practices. So then we can ask, who is able to appropriate the potential for mobility? And that, say that that's a political question. 
what rights to mobility exist, how are they exercised, how are those rights protected, but it's also an ethical question, what capabilities of this potential for movement are valued, defended, extended to all? Who's thinking about this? Who's making changes? Um, who's trying to uh, push the, the sort of envelope to make the world more accessible, which also includes the right to dwell, right? Who can stay in place? Who can have the goods they need in their immediate locality, right? You know, we hear about the 15-minute city and how great that would be. We can just walk out and get everything we need. But if that's associated with gentrification and rising prices for housing, other people are being displaced by that. So whose capabilities are valued and defended? So this field of mobility studies or mobilities research, it thinks across scales and across systems. We think about the immediate interaction between our embodied um, practices at the, the scale of the body. We think about transport systems, you know, auto mobility as a dominant system, public transport, active transport, uh, sustainable low carbon transitions in transport. We think about urban infrastructure space. And when I talk about the urban, I'm, I, I'm thinking about also the connection to the rural, to the exurban, to the suburban. Like what does urbanization mean in, in its forming of all of those different types of spaces? And then we think about transnational mobility, right? So who can cross borders? What are ports of entry? How are they controlled? How does citizenship uh, control who can move? And uh, all of the different regimes for visas and travel, and of course travel disruption, right, that we've experienced with the COVID pandemic. And then we also finally think at the scale of the global, right, of, as I mentioned already, logistic systems, but also planetary mobilities of different kinds, including of non-human things like um, carbon dioxide emissions, right? Those are mobile too. And the impacts of them move around the world with our weather systems. The planet itself is a geophysical mobile entity. And at that big scale, there's, there's important uh, interactions with human systems as well and human mobilities. So in my own work, um, this goes back to a 2003 book called Uprootings, Regroundings that was co-edited with Sara Ahmed, Claudia Castaneda, and Anne-Marie Fortier, Consuming the Caribbean, books like Aluminum Dreams. I've been interested in this question. How are some bodies immobilized by the very processes that produce the mobility of other bodies, commodities, and knowledges? And I would add to that, not only are, how are they immobilized, but maybe how are they forcibly displaced as well and made to move in less safe and less comfortable ways. So immobilities are relational and entangled. Here's an example, just, you know, I'm gonna give just a couple basic examples. Gendered mobility justice issues. 75% of unpaid care work is done by women in the US. Females form up to 66% of public transport users. Women are more likely to trip chain, meaning do multiple trips for multiple purposes in a row. Women more often travel with luggage and with other people, including children or elderly people, family members. Women often travel with more time pressure. And the car is less often the default choice for women who have had less access to cars historically than men. So if you take all those things together and then you realize a lot of our transportation planning is planned around the single individual making the single commute, often by automobile, to uh, in, in a like one purpose trip. That's how we sort of count the data on our you know level of service and our roadways and and who we imagine is traveling. So women's perspectives and experiences have often been excluded or misinterpreted, misrepresented in the data we collect and in the way we plan transportation systems. That's just one example. Another example, the Black Lives Matter movement. As you know, it arises in part from the m killing of m many African American people who were in our public spaces, right? On roadways, driving, walking in the road, and had encounters with police that led to their deaths. 
So implicit in the rise of Black Lives Matter is the longstanding issue of black mobility, argues Rod Clare. That is, where can black people go and when can they go there? The idea of black mobility, he writes, has been a fundamental query since African Americans were brought to America as enslaved people. As such, their movements and associations were always strictly monitored and in many cases prohibited by laws, slave patrols, and other means. After the end of slavery, this remained the case in the South and indeed in, in other parts of the country well into the 20th century through black codes, the Ku Klux Klan, terrorism, sharecropping contracts, city zoning laws, segregation, and various other means. All of that history still shapes our spaces today, our mobilities, our unequal access, and the way in which we are policed in different ways. So it's really important to rem remember that. This is one of those images of, that was used to advertise runaway slaves, right, in our newspapers across this country, including in New England, when, you know, with the fugitive slave law, people could come to track their runaway slaves, I say that in parentheses, uh, all the way up into New England and try to return them. You know, it's linked to the Underground Railroad, what it means, what does it mean to travel um, covertly? Uh, what are the, the different histories and experiences of that that people still carry with them? What do people carry with them? This woman's carrying a small bag. Um, there's a wonderful artistic project recently that's recovering a small bag that was carried by a young girl that was given to her mother when she was sold away from her in the 19th century. And she embroidered it um, to, to say the story, her story in a sentence. And then the third example I'll just give has to do with migration, which of course is very pertinent to our global school and to global issues. As you all know, there has been just this month an unbelievably horrific crisis on the US-Mexico border with more than 14,000 Haitian uh, migrants who were just kind of left to be um, shelter under this highway this raised highway infrastructure. Um, I call it a, a humanitarian reception crisis because our humanitarian reception system is broken, it's not working, and it's extremely slow. We're unable to deal with this. But beyond that, this migration, um, and um, the map is a little blurry, but you'll see Haiti there in the middle of the Caribbean. It dates back to the period after the 2010 earthquake, Haitians, left Haiti and they were welcomed, open door policy to Brazil and later to Chile and to Argentina where they worked. They worked in low paid jobs there. Those countries opened to those migrants and gave them work. But then with the economic downturns, they began closing that door and they began cutting them off from jobs and from access and they didn't have residency there. And so that then pushed towards this the migration, the red line, which is the migration north, where there was hope that the US would open its borders. So this is a very complex trans-regional story of the Americas and of the failure of our policies over a decade, right? This is not a sudden thing that just happened. This has been building up, we've known about this, and we also have a long history of excluding Haitians from American um, migration policies, offering sometimes temporary protected status, which we have done, but then cutting it off again. Um, Haitians were detained and imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay before it became a terrorist uh, detention center. It was a Haitian migrant detention center. And thousands of these people have been put on deportation flights and sent back to Haiti, which is in the middle of a political crisis at the moment and is extremely um, unable to welcome them. and, and um, deal with that influx. So I talk about these issues a lot more in my book, Island Futures, which really looks at the question of Caribbean survival and Caribbean futures. Um, and, and the image on the cover of the book is by Haitian American artist, Edouard Duval Carrier. And it represents the sort of all of the spirits of um, Haitian voodoo, which are very important to the understanding the culture of Haiti. And they're in this boat and they're looking, right, it looks, seems like for a place to, to stay, a place to settle. They're carrying that tree with them. They're looking for a place to be rooted. And um, 
I'll, that's all I'll say about that for now. But again, it's a question of mobility justice, a really important one that we need to deal with. So Hagar Kotath, in an important book called Movement and the Ordering of Freedom, has argued that liberal democracies have always operated in tandem with regimes of deportation, expulsion, and expropriation, as well as confinement and enclosure, implementing different rationalities of rule to which colonized, poor, gendered, and racialized subjects were subjective, subjected. So the freedom of movement of some limits, hides, and even denies the existence of others. Movement is one of the attributes of political space. Political spaces are often moving spaces, and movement is therefore primary to political spheres. So when you think about why do we call social movements movements, it, it has its foundation in that politics of movement, of being to be part of a public sphere means being able to move together, to protest, to march, to do a sit-in, right? Those are all forms of moving um, and highlighting movement, to do a blockade, to do uh, many of the actions of social movements are mobile actions. Um, so again, I'll just sum that up as kinopolitics and I just wanted to put in this one mention um, that this whole field of study, this area of interest has spread also into other adjacent areas, including art and public art. And this um, is just one example of a art exhibit um, that I um, participated in with a commentary at the Coast Museum of Art in Denmark. It was called Transit, and it investigates transit sites and the many kinds of travelers using them. Train platforms and stations and bus terminals and airports where crowds of travelers cross every day. They implemented a whole series of public art um, installations and, and uh, interactions in the transit spaces, in these public spaces, to ask um, about commuters traveling to and from work, tourists on holiday, migrants and refugees, all in transit and all meeting in these transit spaces or telling their stories. To go back to the storytelling from yesterday, the telling of stories is so important. And we can ask which travelers have the right to be where. How do we react to other travelers? What kind of travelers are we? And this was one of the art pieces that shows um, uh, travelers on a um, Turkish airline sitting on, on the roof, right, and on the wings, because they're, they're unable to access airspace itself. So let me then now move to the social movements for mobility justice. And this will be the second half of my talk, and then I'll conclude after that. So there have been as I was working on this project, um, on this book, Mobility Justice, I, out of the blue, really, became aware that there were organizations that were mobilizing around mobility justice. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that was happening. And it was coming out of the space of bicycle justice and urban transformation. And it's really interesting because it was a period when um, we were you know, talking about cities transitioning to more sustainable mobilities, right? Having more bike lanes, having more infrastructure. But a group of sort of people engaged in that transport space who came from black, Latinx, indigenous, and, and other minoritized identities, they said, we're not included in this space. They're not talking about us. Why aren't we part of this conversation? And there was a lot of bike collectives and bike movements that involved these marginalized groups who started to really look at bicycle race, as Adonio Lugo puts it in the title of her book on transportation culture and resistance. So they formed um, a group called People for Mobility Justice, uh, and they, they started to sort of intervene in this, and they, they described themselves, um, along with this group, the untokening, as a multiracial collective that centers the experiences of marginalized communities to address mobility justice and equity. And People for Mobility Justice said that they centered black and brown communities in order to transcend systems of oppression and violence. We uplift each other to actively resist displacement, the police state, transphobia, homophobia, sexism, racism, classism, ageism, ableism, anti-blackness, 
xenophobia, Islamophobia, um, oppression and colonization and exploitation, okay? So that was like what this movement was coming out of and it brought together this um, collective. They held their first convening, as they called it, in Atlanta in 2016. And they then have held a number of convenings in different cities, um, including Detroit, Los Angeles, um, et cetera. And what they're asking is who represents cycling cultures or active transport or transport planning cultures and for whom? Who is represented? Who defines the space? Who makes policy decisions? Who designs infrastructure? What languages and imagery are brought to the table and who is left out? This photograph, it's a little hard to see um, in the lighting in the room, but hopefully online you can see it. This is from a slow roll that I saw in, uh, happening in New Orleans one evening. I was at a conference there, and these bikers come rolling by with music playing and lights flashing. This is happening all over cities in the US, these slow rolls, which are to reclaim that space for people who have been excluded from it, and to say, you know, we're, we're bicyclists too, and we count also. So this movement began to influence transport planning. Um, many of the advocates were invited to speak at different urban planning and transport planning organizations. Some have gone on to be hired within those organizations, right, within city planning, within um, consultancy groups. This is a, an event that was at the AIA New York um, for, you know, at the Center for Architecture on Mobility and Social Agency, Embedding Equity in Mobile Systems. So the, the whole discourse around this has really taken off. And I'm gonna just go through a few slides um, and then I'll wrap up. These are about um, how the Untokening published a set of what they call Principles for Mobility Justice. And these came out of the convenings that they held and the people they brought together to kind of come up with this platform. And what they say is mobility justice centers people over profit, property, or placemaking. It prioritizes the community's lived experiences and aspirations. It recognizes human infrastructure and ensures new projects enhance rather than erase or displace existing communities. And they talk about this in the context of urban development and neighborhood changes and sustainable, equitable mobility projects. They also highlighted differences in, in identity, that people, when people live at the intersection of multiple, what they call vectors of oppression, unfettered access to mobility and public space are not guaranteed. So they think about how racism and sexism and classism, et cetera, have imposed constraints on different people um, and that bodies encounter different risks and have different needs. So this was a, conversation about what do we mean by safety? When we talk about road safety, is it just to do with act, you know, car crashes or is it to do with other kinds of safety? Safety is more than protection from cars. And they also argued that mobility justice needs to decenter Eurocentric solutions as the default model. And the whole discourse of solutions, and this is important, I think, for WPI when we think about engineering and global impact and solutions, that we need to look towards dynamic grassroots approaches and solutions elsewhere, such as South and Central America and Southeast Asia. It also demands language justice and information access that does not exclude some people because they speak different languages or through professional, technical, or academic jargon. And that's a message for all of us in universities to hear, right? That we need to meet people where they're at, where the vulnerable and marginalized feel comfortable or have power. And mobility justice, crucially, recognizes that communities are often treated as if they are unfit to design their own futures, to guide public spending or understand the real issues at hand. And they call for decision-making systems and structures created by and for these communities to center their visions and cultivate principles that align with their values and lived experience. And I think that's a great message, not just for mobility justice, but for any kind of social justice advocates who are working in this space. Um, and to think about how are we you know, embracing the leadership of, of the communities or the localities that we work with. So, 
I'll just wrap up with a few conclusions. Um, and uh, this is an, another example of a, you know, a, a, an organization called Equiticity, which is in Chicago and looks at how mobility is justice and can be made more just. So as educators and students and academics, as researchers, what can we do? How can a mobility justice approach inform our educational approaches? How can we train a new generation of diverse and inclusive STEM students in community-centered project-based learning that we specialize in here at WPI that incorporates mobility justice into the social justice frameworks? How can we develop transdisciplinary work that integrates ethical engineering, action research, community-based learning, and social justice in mobilities-related sectors that some of us might be working on? So transport automation, smart technologies, mobility as a service, electrification of our transport system. Can we begin with some mobility justice principles before we launch these new technologies? And also, as part of the global school, I have to ask, how can academic global travel be made more just? Who has access to study abroad, to conferences, to international research, and, and to impact, what we call impact? Who is impacted and who is um, maybe being negatively impacted? So a few thoughts for advancing mobility justice here at WPI. First, I'll be founding a mobility justice lab here in 2022. Um, more to come on that soon. Uh, second, some people here have raised the question whether we could commit to moving towards net zero carbon travel by 2035 and divesting from fossil fuels in our endowment fund as Harvard University has recently done um, after a very concerted effort and movement over a long period of time. Could our academic mobilities be committed to global cooperative projects and knowledge sharing that are built on what are called fair travel principles, like the fair trade movement? There's a fair travel movement. Could we create scholarships to enable those with less, less access to travel to come here to WPI to study, learn, and share knowledge with us? We can reflect on mobility justice in how we ourselves travel to global project centers and what our relation is to local communities. And we could start to measure our contributions to the UN's sustainable development goals, which include strong social justice elements. So those are just a few steps I'm thinking about, and I'm really excited to hear from our colleagues and the work they're doing, which relates to many of these questions from all different angles, and um, I'm looking forward to our conversation and questions. Thank you. And I'm going to invite Lorene back up to introduce our next segment. Thanks, and I won't spend too much time with more introductions as we've already done the introductions. So um, why don't I welcome Shams Bada and Jennifer DeWinter to, uh, well, you can either speak at the podium or you can speak with your microphones at the table, as you wish. Yeah, is this on? Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, being the systems engineer, I come to this, uh, it was a very nice uh, talk, and I learned a lot about mobility justice uh, than I have ever, and I realized I've been doing some of that work and didn't realize it was uh, mobility justice. Um, Get it close to your mouth. Okay, close to your mouth. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll talk about a couple of projects that I've been involved in, and as a systems engineer, we also look at relationships. I always tell my students, uh, systems engineers live and die in relationships, in interfaces, but these are mostly different types of engineering coming together. So the electrical hardware coming with software, software coming with people and processes. But a couple of projects in which I realized I'm looking at the information and data mobility is with, um, with the Doula project. The Doula project focuses on communities of color birth collective. LA County has half the black children getting reported. And why is that? They have a paper-based survey that goes to every new mom 
and they are supposed to fill that out, and that decides how the community resources get allocated. So we started thinking around why is it that only half the black kids are getting reported and what's going on? And as we investigated, it started dealing with homelessness. It started dealing with trust in the institutions. And so we band together with my colleague at uh, Arizona State, and we thought of thinking about building a system of trust. Now, system of trust means different things to different disciplines. In systems engineering, it is mostly, okay, I trust this data, and I trust this data, and we agreed that these two data talk to each other. But as we started exploring that space, we realized that system of trust really needs to be built up on stories telling. So we investigated storytelling philosophies and also looking into humanizing the tools and practices used in systems engineering to broader communities. And in that sense, we collaborated with an artist that is now rendering a human, equipped human reference architecture that is more representative and easily understood than what my colleague in communications likes to call it boxes and arrows. That's mostly my research is boxes and arrows and she's more artistic. So that's, that's one of the data and information mobility that sort of has worked. NSF did give us some funding and we are really looking forward to uh, forward that research. And well, while I was doing all that work, my friend Jennifer comes and says, I need to figure out how to deal with public transportation and public transportation policies. And I'm like, what's going on with public transportation policies? So that's when again the data comes in and my background being in um, code quality and looking at code quality comments and making that as in using natural language processing and techniques to then identify where are the gaps in the code and relating that to the software, I use similar principles looking into policy and the way policy is written. So just looking at pure natural language, modeling that natural language into a descriptive model and how the gaps in those structural constructs and behavioral constructs influence the underlying engineered system. And that is mostly what um, uh, Professor Mil uh, Seller was talking about in mobility justice. So that's like what I, that's the way we think about it is there are policies, there are regulations, there is lots of movement going on, and here is the engineered system that is then feeling the impacts and spasming. At this point, it's really spasming on a lot of things. And so we've been, we've been like, you know, going back and forth and back and forth. Where is this uh, communal space where policymakers, citizens, and engineers can really come together and build consensus. And that's sort of where Jennifer and I have been exploring the space of games, the space of simulations, to really help with that interaction. Yeah, so on top of Shams's excellent work, excellent work on policy modeling, policy content modeling, uh, we decided to start using simulation and game design in order to create systems that allowed major stakeholders to test their assumptions. Uh, and the idea was first that uh, it's, expensive, it's expensive to propose changes to any form of transportation mechanism. But you can test out assumptions. Uh, and we were going, we were doing historical research, we were doing economic research, we were doing uh, stakeholder analysis, we were especially focusing, uh, in Worcester, we were, we were focusing on uh, both, both access and multi-point access, but especially the disadvantaged communities. About 50% of Worcester residences, uh, residents are immigrants to the US. So we, we were really thinking through what is it to have a dynamic global population in Worcester and how, what's public about public transportation. Um, we know, we know from my research that people are, I'm, I'm gonna say rarely, but I almost always say never. Um, they're never convinced by logic. It doesn't matter how much data you show them. Uh, it doesn't, 
matter how much evidence you show them, they're not convinced. They know, they know the logic. They know it's a good idea or a bad idea, but, but the, for whatever reason, they're immobilized or they're not motivated to see it through. And so in bringing forward uh, a simulation, we're like, if, if you care about economics, it's not a it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. You're not gonna pay for a bus system or a public transportation system by fares alone. What we will see is economic benefit through taxes, through densification, through a whole series of other things. And so now you can start testing that and see it. By adding gamic elements, what we found in testing it with the policymakers is that they wanted to win. And so in many ways, we're using the embedded rhetorical logic of a game to convince them that this is the direction that they want to go. Um, and so we're, we're well into that process. We're actually about to add um, water management, Massachusetts water management, because why not? Like, why not add more complexity to this? Um, and that's it. I'm happy with Shams to answer questions soon. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, everyone. I uh, just want to say thanks for the invitation, Lorene, Eunice, um, uh, Mimi, uh, for uh, kind of outlining some of the things that we're going to be talking about and all the folks associated with ANS Week uh, for having me here today. Um, so I am going to talk, I'm a historian of, of migration, and so I'm going to talk about mm, some slightly esoteric things that I think are relevant also, and I'll point out where I think um, they're relevant to some of the other things that you're going to hear about uh, on the panel. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm transitioning uh, between research projects right now. So um, I've sort of just finished something, I'm, I'm starting something else, and um, I thought to talk a little bit about how I'm, tr how I'm transitioning among those projects uh, in a scholarly way. and. Uh, and also some observations I've uncovered in sort of my more recent work, um, how uh, preliminary they might be. So my current book, uh, which is coming out in a couple months, was on Italian communities in South America. And um, it's really about the co-presence of Italians in places like Montevideo, Uruguay, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Buenos Aires, Argentina, and how they try and manage their co-presence in places of origin and arrival sort of at the same time. And um, so it's, it's a social history of diaspora and connections and mobilities kind of across the Atlantic, but also within inter-American networks of communication and exchange and interaction among uh, different places within the diaspora, say. So it does actually have some really significant relationships to uh, things that we're seeing today, particularly because I use World War I as sort of a, a way into the, some, exploring some of these, uh, these networks and, and interactions. And, it's a period where actually there's significant immobility because of the war and also because of the flu pandemic from 1918, 1919 that, that comes out of the war, um, where physical mobility is constrained, but nevertheless, other forms of mobility are really even ramped up uh, by it. Um, financial mobilities through, you know, sort of transatlantic financial systems, uh, you know, ideological mobilities, uh, you know, media mobilities, and those sorts of things are quite significant and have relationships, I think, to um, things we're seeing with this latest pandemic in terms of immobility kind of, but yet crisis causing people to kind of interact with their places of origin in, in really interesting ways, even if they can't get there. But um, one of the conclusions that I developed from that research is that these Italians in particular in these places were really focused on, through their co-presence, kind of building notions of Latinness within their community. And so Latinita in Italian or Latinidad in Spanish or Latinidad in Portuguese. And basically using this term sort of over and over again uh, as a way to pursue two forms of inclusion, both in their places of residence and their places of origin by looking at historical reasons for that and even cultural uh, reasons for that in sort of their present. And even distinguishing themselves from sort of Anglo-American notions of um, of sort of Europeanness or even whiteness, right? So sort of creating an alternative whiteness in some ways within sort of like a South Atlantic kind of uh, geography. So while I was definitely, when I sort of saw all of this talk of Latinness and that sort of thing, I was definitely thinking, okay, I'm gonna connect this to the historiography associated with what is Latin America, 
you know, that term is contested in many ways, right, uh, a, a Latin America. But I also started noticing that, like, we're hearing this term all the time, right, in the present. The Latin, Latinus, Latino, Latina, Latinx, and that sort of thing, which I think demonstrates that this remains a contested term in some ways, right? It's constantly being negotiated. Um, but also that it can, can mean different things in different places for different peoples at different times, right? And so um, I've been trying to figure out how to get at that notion of what Latinness could mean or how it might change over space and time and among different peoples kind of as I transition to the next thing. Um, so um, so I've, I've sort of thought about how to develop this as a framework. Um, you may or may not know that uh, there is a lot of the history of sort of the term Latin in the United States has a lot of origins in a focus on Italian communities. So uh, notions of the Latin mother, um, these sort of overbearing, fiery, kind of emotional Latin mother, you know, have origins in sort of late 19th, early 20th century perceptions of Italians. Uh, the Latin lover was originally, you know, sort of built around the, the image and celebrity of Rudolfo uh, Valentino, Rudolf Valentino, who was sort of a silent film star. Um, kind of this, these notions of maybe criminality, of vag vagrancy, marginalization, maybe associated with what it means to be Latin in the United States, also have some historical origins uh, in uh, Italian mass migration, right? And so I'm also interested in race and ethnicity as well, though. So there's certain connections to brownness or elements of non-whiteness associated with this that I'm, I'm um, very much interested in. So we can kind of look at right, how there's movement within these categories to some degree, like different people can be called different things or the same thing at different times based on how they're being perceived by mainstream society or how they, they're situated in mainstream society. So it brings up a lot of questions about race and ethnicity and, and not just brownness, but also blackness and whiteness in the United States in sort of really interesting ways because it's the sort of the place where a lot of these things kind of meet and move. Um, so that's sort of how I've ended up where I am with my sort of current research. And I'm not, this is not a project of popular culture or anything like that. I'm starting to look at particular neighborhoods in the US Northeast. Uh, of industrialized cities or deindustrializing cities or mill towns where there was significant intersection between peoples from, w of Italian origins and of origins within Latin America, right? And particularly in sort of the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s into the 1980s, when there was this transition to some degree happening, not only in the demographics of these neighborhoods, but also in notions of what Latinness could mean within the US context. So I've started taking a look at East Boston in particular for a couple of reasons, um, some of which you know, could be interesting in relating it to other, other folks on this panel. Uh, I, I also have access to the East Boston Community News, which was a weekly publication that was uh, published from 1970 to 1989, and it's, um, it's held by Northeastern, so I'm able to take a look at it. And there's some really interesting kind of preliminary findings that I've uncovered uh, where people of Italian origin, people of Hispanic origin, if you will, uh, who we might call Latin today, uh, are advocating together, right, for in increased services of, within public schools or community organizations for uh, services of English as a second language training. Um, there is a lot of interaction in the Catholic Church in parochial schools as well. Um, even businesses and advertisements who are starting to cater to both of these communities at once. Um, as sort of the, the neighborhood is changing in interesting ways. And there's also a ton of contention among these two communities that's worth exploring as well. Uh, you know, this, this neighborhood is undergoing significant changes during this time period. The, the city itself is, is under a period of crisis in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, where resources are being cut. Um, there's uh, a lot of consolidation of Catholic churches happening that's very contentious and causes contentions among these communities. There's differences in opinions about whose fault it is, you know, relative to say, uh, being disconnected to, you know, Boston, not only by the harbor, but also by other kind of factors. Um, and so, um, so there's this kind of like 
really interesting interaction happening among these two communities that I'm exploring as a way to kind of figure out maybe if this is a good vehicle to, fig to uncover, right, elements of this, this notion of Latinness and how, is it, how it changes over, over time and that sort of thing. So I don't have any like amazing conclusions to offer you because I'm just starting this stuff, but, um, but I have been fascinated for a couple reasons. And um, I think one reason I'm interested in East Boston in particular is because it's, it's very often a place for new, new arrivals within the greater Boston area. So this, this as a locus of change, uh, demographic lo locus of change, it's really, really important. And I think it can relate to things like the Shrewsbury Street District in, in Worcester or you know, East Harlem or you know, mill towns like Southridge, Massachusetts or Patterson, New Jersey and so forth where these same communities are interacting. Um, and so uh, you know, in that sense, it, it maybe relates to this notion of like newly arrived immigrants and how they manage sort of their, their processes of integration or interaction with existing communities and that sort of thing, which maybe relates to um, Andy Trapp's work and others. Uh, and I think the things I was mentioning about East Boston being challenged in a bunch of ways. So there's, there's tunnels there, there's a third discussion of a third harbor tunnel, which wasn't built for decades, um, but how that would reshape the neighborhood. There's a lot of discussion of the expansion of Logan Airport and how it would affect these neighborhoods and communities and the coastlines and that sort of thing, because it's already significantly damaged the, the neighborhood in, 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 in important ways. Um, and the, you know, the, the environmental impacts of, of emissions from, from uh, planes and so forth. Um, so you know, this notion of like sort of mobility and transportation mobility and urban sustainability, I think, is a really important piece of this research as well. But I'm most interested in, in sort of this notion of like Latin characteristics and how, they, how these this demographics are changing. But in some ways, the label isn't changing. It still means the same things in some ways. It's still this kind of like racial middle ground, like urban purgatory type of thing. Um, that's the, th that's, that I'm most interested in with this work. So thanks. Hi everyone, um, my name is Andy Trapp. I'm professor of, associate professor of operations in industrial engineering and also have joint appointments in data sciences and mathematical sciences here at WPI. Um, I'm joined by my uh, great PhD student here, G Jerry Demas, um, who's a PhD candidate in data science. Uh, we're gonna talk today about immigration and mobility um, with a, a lens on United States Southern border and I just want to take a moment and say thank you to Laureen and to Eunice for organizing this, to Dean King and, and Dean Scheller as well for the excellent talk. I see a lot of parallels to um, what's on the panel here, so it, it seems like it's a really cohesive unit, so, which is great. Um, so again, I, we're going to zoom in on the United States southern border. Um, I recognize two folks are joining virtually, so uh, for those that are are doing so, we, we can make the slides available. Uh, you can email jerry at gldms at wpi.edu or myself, it's my first initial A, trap, my last name, at wpi.edu. WPI um, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, I think I saw a slide like this uh, that, that Dean Scheller had, had put up. Um, but you know, when we think about, we begin to think about mobility and immigration and the southern border, kind of all those together, and also justice. Um, here I have a few paths, um, several paths of internal and international migration routes. Uh, so folks traveling, you might say, you can see like uh, South America there at the bottom right, um, through Central America up to the border, um, our southern border. Um, and folks are traveling from those countries, but as well as, you know, from beyond that as well, right? I mean, from the Caribbean, um, uh, Africa, even Eastern Europe, you see people kind of traveling through and making this, this, um, this journey. Now I want to speak a little bit to the research that, that my group is doing um, and kind of several fronts here. Uh, one is around actually before the border, 
And here what we're doing is we're matching migrants to stable jobs. Um, this is an important uh, aspect. You can imagine folks that aren't able to cross the border, uh, they're not welcome back home where they are. Um, or maybe they're opportunistically kind of, you know, looking for a better uh, life, better employment. Um, we're, we're partnering with a nonprofit in Mexico City called Entrare. Um, there's a student who recently graduated at WPI that did some work on this. And we're continuing that work to match um, immigrants to stable jobs in Mexico City. Um, along the border, we've just recently proposed, this is a newer initiative, so we just sent a proposal in actually this week to the NSF looking at how to design secure, humane, and efficient operations for the U.S. southern border. That's no light task. I don't propose that we have all the answers there. Uh, but we are looking at some in initiatives to say instead of kind of reacting, um, first looking ahead, estimating where, predicting where humans, uh, human flows might occur, and then directing resources there in advance. Okay, um, both security resources and shelter resources, right? So, so we kind of need both of those. Uh, the third aspect is really beyond the border, and this is analytics for the U.S. immigration court system. So there's kind of three fronts that we're looking at as we, as we consider uh, migration mobility. And as, as we think about maybe who these people are, uh, there's you know, one way to look at them are different categories or classes of migrants, and, and I think one interesting kind of way that I've, that I've seen this as kind of those that are maybe more op opportunistic, they're looking for, you know, better future, better job, you know, better life, okay? Um, there's those that are actually persecuted and they're not able to go back home or they're, they're seeking relief from harm from, or per, from uh, persecution in their country of origin. And then also maybe, for lack of a better word, criminal actors that are there um, exploiting, seeking to illicitly traffic materials, drugs, or even persons, maybe these other types of persons are being trafficked. So we see several different types of uh, actors, if you will. Um, and as, uh, as they intersect with these research thrusts that, that, that we're working on, um, we see this kind of before, along, and beyond at the top and the, the different classes of migrants on the left. Uh, we're really looking at the, the persecuted and beyond that we're gonna expand upon a little bit today, and Jerry's gonna take over here, kind of that category, that intersection there. Thank you, Buster Trapp. So yes, we're looking at, there's kind of two main classes. If you think about persecuted individuals, when we're talking about immigration, it's refugees and asylum seekers. For our purpose of our work right now, we kind of focus on asylum seekers. So I want to just differentiate the difference between the two because sometimes they're oftentimes confused. And there's a big difference when we're talking about the work that we're doing. So refugees, for example, apply for relief prior to entering the United States via the UNHCR, whereas asylum seekers actually apply for the unit asylum after reaching the United States. And that's a big difference because if you think about it, refugees' journey comes to an end in a way when they come to the United States, whereas asylum seekers' journey only begins. Um, refugees then have already gone through this vetted process and are illegally allowed to be in the United States. Asylum seekers, that's why they have to come here, so they can start that process to gain that legal status. Refugees, um, there's a fixed annual ceiling, so meaning we have a way of kind of in a way controlling the number that we are allowing in, whereas asylum seekers, there's actually no ceiling. In theory, there's no limit to upper bound to the number that can come, and part of that is because they're protected by United States law. They're actually, we are required to hear those cases and to process those cases, which leads to kind of the problem that we'll look at. So there are six different federal agencies in the United States that kind of deal with this immigration-related processes. The one that we focus on is the Executive Office for Immigration Review, or the EOIR, which kind of deals with those who are going through a court, more court formal proceeding. The picture, for those of us in the audience can see, it's just a depiction of kind of what that process looks like. There's different ways to come in. Specifically, we have depicted here what it looks like for those seeking asylum. And you can see that in the bottom I guess it'd be your right corner. There's two main processes, one called a master hearing and one called an individual hearing. And what our work focuses on is kind of modeling what does that process look like for individuals? How do they flow through the system? What are the kind of processes in place? And how can we maybe improve that? And the reason and motivation behind this is because there's a massive immigration court backlog. So we've heard from how there's a lot of immigrants coming to the United States right now, as well as over the last few years in particular. 
and it's only getting larger. Um, we have over 1.3 million cases currently waiting to be heard in the system, and there's no sign of this kind of stopping, and so we're really interested in looking at analytics to help us address this problem. Can we understand the system better, and can we look for solutions, or better understand at least the bottlenecks that are causing this to happen? So there's a couple different effects of this backlog that we've kind of identified. One is it causes increased delays for individuals. People can wait up to five, 10 years to kind of come to a conclusion for their case. I personally can't imagine what it's like to sit there waiting to find out if you'll be able to stay in the country that you've grown accustomed to or if you'll be deported back to a country that you may not even know. Um, it's taxing on governmental resources as we've seen in the media and as we know, and it's also really straining on community resources. So some potential causes of these that we've kind of looked at is, well, there's a large influx of migrants, and so of course that's causing this. There's limited court resources, and it's a really antiquated system design. It was originally designed in 1983. Things have changed since then, and the system really hasn't adapted. A lot of the work is still done on paper. A lot of it's kind of um, slowed down through those processes, as well as additional COVID-19 impacts. So, only detained cases were being processed during the height of the pandemic, which increased the backlog significantly. The US border was closed under Title 42, which means people still to this day aren't allowed to necessarily um, activate their right to asylum, to seek asylum in the United States due to the COVID-19. And then also it causes additional strain on resources due to those mandates. So testing and having to separate people and have distances. It's causing a lot of different issues in being able to process these people so our objective is to apply analytics to model this current system. We want to evaluate the current system operations, determine bottlenecks of the system, and test different candidate policies on a simulated system and evaluate their impacts. Part of the motivation behind our work and part of the thing that we really feel will be useful is that if you talk to different domain experts, you ask them, how does the system work? What is the process? People have a really difficult time answering that question because it's very confusing. They're like, when will a case be scheduled? Oh, I have no clue how that works because no one really knows. And so we're seeking to try to better understand or use machine learning and data science to better model that. So we have kind of four main phases we've been working with. Phase one was just the data cleaning exploration. We have the EOIR data set, so we have the full immigration court data set. We've been using that to analyze the data. Phase two is applying machine learning to that data set to better understand it. Phase three is using discrete event simulation to simulate, and we have a baseline model simulated right now. We're moving forward to phase four, which is to vary those model different parameters and kind of evaluate that system. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, in my comments today, I'll take a policy mobility lens to urban sustainability, focusing in particular on urban trees. And this approach conceptualizes policy actors as really embedded in epistemic expert and practice communities, and policy, mobile policies as really partial and fragmented. So the policies evolve through mobility and they're made and remade through specific connections with different places. I'm focusing in particular on urban tree planting initiatives because understanding the ways that urban trees become mobile gives insight into the ways that um, urban sustainability ideas and programming uh, proliferate globally. In the mid 2000s, the urban sustainability planning wave was on the rise. And based on the principle of the sustainable city, mayors began using the number of trees planted as a metric for their overall achievement of sustainability. I'm gonna focus on three particular American cities, Baltimore, Boston, and Philadelphia, which uh, set their tree planting goals uh, between 2007 and 2008. Baltimore had actually been primed to increase its tree canopy since 2004, thanks to the really strong presence of the USDA Forest Service in cooperation with the uh, very strong Recreation and Parks Department. Um, but it was only in 2007 that new mayor, Sheila Dixon, came into office and decided to link her campaign, her mayoral term, uh, with uh, the urban tree planting initiative. And so they, her administration accepted the foresters' recommendation that the city add 750,000 trees by 2040 um, 
which would mean that trees would cover 40% of Baltimore's land area. At that time, Baltimore already had really significant social and legal infrastructure in place uh, to advance the initiative. The state of Maryland actually has some of the strongest uh, forest conservation laws in the country, and the city's laws and Department of Recreation and Parks structure uh, reflect and amplify that um, even further. So this really gave the tree initiative uh, some legs to stand on. First, it provided an ongoing stream of funding in an extremely austere context. You know, truthfully, it would be hard for Tree Baltimore to develop programming without the tree conservation funding um, and the heavy support of the Forest Service in the city um, as budget shortfalls in Baltimore City are, are really extremely dire. Second, the legacy of strong forest conservation had produced a forestry and tree services division within the Recreation and Parks Department, and its senior staff position, the city arborist, um, has been a really very capacious and activist leader within the Parks Department. He procured funds to provide the new initiative with a dedicated staff person, and he hired an excellent greening coordinator who's still working in that capacity today. The city arborist made a second really critical decision um, in the formulation of Tree Baltimore. So he was basically equipping his single greening coordinator with tree saplings and funds to cover uh, planting tools and trees, but really they needed a veritable army of volunteers to actually go out and plan, plant, and uh, monitor the tree plantings. Baltimore's particular ecosystem of different greening organizations consists of many organizations that basically did very similar things. They were competing for the same funding and they would have very uh, overlapping functions on the initiative. So he decided to run the tree initiative in a corporate style, bringing everyone together, uh, sharing very transparently who got grants, you know, what they'd be doing, um, and at least in theory, making decisions cooperatively. Um, in lieu of a large revenue stream, Tree Baltimore has been really effective at uh, building relationships uh, with many and diverse networks. In particular, over the years, the Forest Service gave Tree Baltimore access to a lot of intellectual resources, data analysis, in-kind donations, staffing and funding for marketing and program development on the one hand. And then on the other, Tree Baltimore um, really drove and then was uh, a an active participant in a community of practice with urban foresters ranging from Baltimore, uh, Philly, and Pittsburgh up to Providence, um, notably excluding Boston. Um, and then so moving up to Boston, while the tree initiative landed in Boston in the same year, in 2007, it met an entirely different cultural, uh, political, economic, and uh, organizational landscape. The environmental agency at the state level has historically focused a lot on farming and food systems, development licenses, and biomass production from the forests. So that, and this people orientation really filtered down to the city. The Parks and Recreation Department has long seen urban green space primarily as opportunities for sports, barbecues, golf courses, etc. Moreover, the Parks Commissioner at the time was a lifelong bureaucrat, basically um, waiting out her days until she retired. And people in City Hall would joke that they didn't even know where the Parks Department was because it was located in a remote uh, industrial location in Dorchester near the highway. So Boston's effort was almost doomed from the start. Um, the impetus for their tree canopy goals came from an environmental justice organization that did an inventory of street trees across the city. And that inventory showed that some neighborhoods like East Boston had only 6% uh, tree cover, whereas others like West Roxbury had 25%. So they produced a report, they gave it to the mayor, and Mayor Menino, who was very proud to be known as a mayor of the people, saw an opportunity to support neighborhood well-being um, with the initiative. You know, he held a press conference at his favorite environmental justice neighborhood that would be his priority for many years. At the press conference, shovel in hand, you know, he announced that Boston would commit to planting 100,000 trees by 2030. And then the next day, his office called the NGO 
and issued the organization a directive to develop the program so that the city could meet its tree planting goals. So here, the tree planting initiative in Boston met another challenge. Unlike Baltimore and Philadelphia, Boston really did not have a track record of completing pro cooperative or collaborative projects with nonprofit organizations. The mayor's office assumed that it could hand off responsibility for the tree planting initiative without providing any funds for its program development or staffing. And the NGO did not consider that to be adequate. And, and basically, the different members were locked in a stalemate um, for multiple years until it finally collapsed. After a year of dormancy, the city of Boston agreed to pay for a staff person. Um, by that time, unfortunately, the environmental justice organization had gone under. So a gardening organization accepted that position, um, but was a gardening organization, was not a forestry organization. So after stumbling along for another year, finally the tree planting initiative ended for good. Since that time, a couple new organizations have popped up, um, but for the most part, the campaign to increase Boston's tree canopy by 100,000 trees has largely be been considered a failure. So moving over to, to Philly, when, when the tree planting initiative arrived in Philly in 2008, um, Mayor, at the time candidate, uh, Anthony Nutter, uh, was gearing up for an election, and he tied his election campaign very closely to um, saying that he wanted to turn Philadelphia into the most sustainable city in the country. After he won the election, he turned to an academic at Penn to develop a comprehensive uh, sustainability plan of which uh, increasing the tree canopy was one part. Uh, that plan pledged to increase the tree canopy by 300,000 uh, trees by 2016. And similar to Baltimore, Mayor Nutter then handed off the responsibility for the tree, co tree canopy goal to his uh, Parks and Recreation Department, and he provided funds for additional staffing uh, dedicated to this program. When the tree initiative landed in Philadelphia, it met a lot of resources. Um, similar to Baltimore, the Philly Parks and Recreation Department already had uh, a well-staffed forestry division, and the head of the forestry division was also very capable, very well-trained, and possessing great initiative. She hired an excellent Tree Philly staff person who is also still working in that capacity today, and she immediately commissioned a high resolution uh, image uh, analysis of tree cover in, in Philadelphia in order to uh, enable data driven decision making. Maybe most notably, though, the Recreation and Parks Department sorry, they have different orders the Parks and Recreation Department had a nonprofit fundraising arm which allowed it to access grants that were unavailable to public entities. And through the conservancy, they got a multi-year uh, contract with Wells Fargo, who had just moved to Philadelphia and was looking to build its local reputation. And that funding gave Tree Philly an unusual amount of freedom to uh, really experiment with creative programming, partnerships, and marketing materials too. So taken together, the, the three cases show that when a concept for, or when the concept of uh, the tree initiative arrived at each city, it was devoid of a specific philosophy or program. You know, the goal was really very simple, to increase the number of trees planted in the city. But the way that the city would accomplish that and its ability to reach those goals really varied tremendously. You know, Boston's tree planting initiative ultimately reinforced the city's recreational priorities and disregard for urban forestry, and Mayor Menino's longtime disregard for data driven governance, too. And in particular, it, it highlighted the contrast between the environmental justice claims of the mayor and the unwillingness of the city to be accountable to those claims. Um, in addition, I think it, it also shows how public interest city departments, such as park de parks departments, really play an important role in fulfilling or stymieing equity goals of a city. In contrast, Baltimore's and Philadelphia's initiatives continued and built on their urban forest legacies, mm -hmm. um, as well as their methods of using geographic information science to inform decision making. And both initiatives have really prioritized environmental justice through innovative means to distribute uh, trees in, uh, in neighborhoods with low tree cover. 
So overall, these snapshots show that the process of assembling policies across cities is far from a linear process, far from a kind of complete process. Really, it's, it's a multidimensional and a dynamic process in which uh, a policy, in Peck and Theodore's words, evolves through mobility while at the same time remaking relational connections between policymaking sites. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. That, those were just amazing talks um, that really illustrated, I think, each and every talk really illustrated the interaction between cultural, political, legal frameworks and contexts, um, and the material and very serious outcomes of, of mobilities. So um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mimi back up to the stage um, for a Q&A. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, or maybe, yeah, about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so if anybody would like to ask a question from the audience, maybe I would invite you up to, this, to the microphone so that everybody can hear and the audience at home can hear. And then, oh, perfect, awesome. There's a traveling microphone, so please raise your hand if you have a question. And I am going to attempt to find um, our chat to see if there's any questions from our, our virtual audience. Hi, thank you all, such, such interesting talks. Um, I'm Lindsay Davis, I'm a historian um, in the Humanities and Arts Department, so aptly my, my question is for John. <laughs> um, I was so interested in this notion of like thinking about and tracing Latinness in the, in the US context, kind of where your research is going. And since you're moving through this post-war period, I'm wondering if the Supreme Court case Loving v. Virginia which you know, you know, strikes down bans on interracial marriage. If that is, if that is coming up at all, like, is there sort of this anxiety about protecting whiteness, and how does sort of this notion of of Latinness, which you described as um, like an alternative form of whiteness in the Latin American context, like, do you see these anxieties about protecting whiteness as as coming up at all? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I haven't seen that particular uh, sort of legal uh, case mentioned. I'm mostly focused on the U.S. Northeast, which is not to say that it's irrelevant to that. But um, but what I have, so when I think about, yes, yeah, so I think it's good that you pointed out that like this notion of like Latinus being an alternative form of whiteness in Latin America is versus like say maybe an alternative form or one form of brownness, right? In in the US, so that's even interesting kind of in and of itself, I think, with that distinction. Um, and so what I have noticed, and you know, if we, you know, we know to some degree what these processes might end up looking like is that there is, are some elements within the people who are of Italian origin, and I should say that there's a wave of Italian migration to the US after World War II, so there are actually some Italians who have been there for generations and there's some newer arrivals who would need, say, you know, English as a second language training or, you know, that sort of thing. And definitely were socioeconomically much more, uh, which much different than the folks who had been there for, the families had been there for some time. But, um, but the, you can see to some degree uh, through like Italians kind of blaming new arrivals for increasing use in, of heroin and, um, uh, you know, sort of the degradation of the neighborhood, even though, right, it's the resources are being cut and that sort of thing, and it's um, that they're trying to maybe separate themselves from other uh, communities and newly arrived communities. And so they're, and you know, you can start to also see white flight to the suburbs or the continuation of white flight to the suburbs or ethnic whites is sometimes what like Jews and Italians and Greeks are kind of thought of as during this time period. Um, so they're not fully white, but they're ethnic white. So that's, um, but so to make a long story short, because I don't want to go on, um, is that you start to see some of that formation of like uh, Italians taking their own initiative to sort of push for their inclusion in, in more white spaces. 
um, by partly kind of um, trying to remove themselves from too much uh, sort of um, relation, close relation to newer arrivals. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I really do want to thank Eunice and Maureen for doing such a great job bringing you all together. It has been fabulous for me to listen to all of you and to speak to what Mimi said. And Mimi, I hope I'm not misquoting you. But immobility are relational and entangled. And I kept thinking of each and every one of you as you spoke and I saw the entanglements of what you were doing with somebody else. And what I'm asking is here at WPI, obviously for social justice, we're trying to pull all of these pieces together. Could each of you speak about a new entanglement that you have formed or thought about as you heard the other person talk about what it is they're doing? So maybe I wanted to start with you because you're here in all of our faculty for the first time. Do you see new entanglements? Do you see new relational opportunities for us to take this to the next level so it's not just about today, but how we move forward? Thanks, Jean. Great, great question. And um, I think what's most uh, exciting for me is hearing all of these projects and thinking about, oh, wow, where would I make an intervention from a mobility justice perspective and pose questions to each of you? And maybe that would be helpful and productive. So for example, um, to begin with Catherine's, the final talk on the tree cover in Philadelphia, of course, I'm from Philadelphia and I've, I've been there um, during this period. And one really interesting thing that happened in Philadelphia is that some uh, working class communities did not want the trees. And there was a political struggle to reject the tree planting as some kind of gentrification project. And it took a huge amount of communication, which connects to Jennifer's project of how do you tell the story of why trees are actually a good thing and you you know you, you don't need to worry in a sense but maybe you do need to worry right so what are the worries and how do we hear from communities and hear them tell their stories about why they might not want trees and it's a complicated story same with bike lanes why they didn't want bike lanes um, and that you know relates broadly to questions of immigrant communities in Philadelphia, to t speak to John's um, uh, topic, because many of those tight-knit immigrant communities in Philadelphia have been displaced by gentrification or different waves of arriving migrants. And so the issues of neighborhood struggle are very important and they're racialized and often the people bringing the bike lanes and the trees and so on were white. So. That's an important part of that story. And, and that brings us back to our borders, right? And who is let in? And why are um, Haitians in particular the most excluded group in many ways? And differences in our policy towards different immigrant communities, who is seen as a legitimate refugee or asylum seeker and who is not? Where is it considered acceptable to send people back to and where is it not acceptable? So all of these different topics are actually entangled with each other from my point of view. I would just say, um, actually, John, you pointed out a, a connection that I would build on around thinking about the communities where refugees are resettled um, and immigrants are, are located and, and how can we think carefully about the fabric of those communities and build those into analytical tools, tools that can improve decision making, not, not, not override our, but support our, our decision making. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, Andy and I talked a little bit about this before uh, we got up here, because um, I think, you know, including, oh, sorry. Did you? Well, I'm, yeah, go ahead. All you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if, uh, sorry, <laughs> terrible. Um, uh, yeah, so um, so this notion of like including in a, through quantitative variables social issues, right? And so how you might do that and how you might model settlement and inclusion and exclusion and integration, 
right, using social variables and not just say like you know skills and 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 demand for for employment and or employer employees and that sort of thing and to to facilitate maybe um, settlement in other ways, not just getting a job, but uh, socially. No. <laughs> he covered it well. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think there are a lot of uh, places. I think introducing more cultural identities in the analytic model. That's one of the things that I have seen that I have never modeled, and that results in having no output. It's garbage. It becomes um, more of a not having a complete person represented in analytical model, and that includes the identity and the social and the economical and the immigrant. Force, I think that that might be something we can discuss. Also using the language, what type of language is used and how it is interpreted by different populations. And that has become very interesting to me to see uh, with my work with the communities of color and other places is that it's, a, it's um, interpreted by different communities in different ways. So for an engineer, what is dig a hole which is this much is completely different to somebody else. And so that's that's where I think we can look into things. Yeah, in, in, we all have so many research interests, right? So I'm gonna actually gonna talk about like how I was thinking about something else completely differently. And, and it has to do with borderlands, right? Like that there are these strange liminal places and they're often dehumanizing. Um, that they're often messy, they're often where you see tires dumped. I'm even thinking about when, when Mimi was talking about the mobili like, international mobilities, what is like the most dehumanizing place in that entire thing? And it's in customs, right? So, so if, if I'm thinking about all the ways in which we're trying to humanize processes, what are the spatial places that resist humanization? Uh, and, and so that's what I started thinking about a lot during this. Also, also, I think visualization, I think that's another place where we've been experimenting is visualization. Like, okay, this is how the, the city looks like, but if you don't do tree planting, this is what the city will look like and popularizing that in the popular culture. That's sort of, I think, where, where Jennifer and I have been looking at visualizations. Yeah, I would say, in, in general, I think uh, landscape visualizations, whether it's GIS or a variety of different constructivist images and putting them together can be really, really effective in engaging very different perspectives about, about place. Um, so I just really wanted to build on that. And like my comments were obviously really focused narrowly on the ways that ideas about trees become materially manifest in places. Um, I think like, John and Mimi's comments really drive home that Tree planting is fundamentally a socio-environmental socio process, and, and it's around placemaking. And sometimes the, the, the tree initiatives, especially under this rush to increase the tree canopy by a certain percentage, by a certain time, or by a certain number, um, can get overly focused on uh, trees as the, the main mechanism and not creating places um, for health, the health and well-being of neighbors and neighborhoods. And in particular, focusing on you know, Latinx communities and the ways that they might interact with green spaces, not to, it's tricky, not, not to uh, overly generalize or say all Latinx people have some specific relationship with, with trees uh, and green space, but one, recurring theme um, has often uh, been involved more of a focus on uh, kind of sports and recreational spaces. And they're coming into, in North America, green a green space culture, which is very much informed by Olmsted, very much saying, when you come here, you know, the, the role of parks is to learn how to become white and middle class. So you need, you, you can have picnics, but you can't play soccer. And a lot of Olmsted parks, including um, the one in Worcester, like routinely keep uh, teenagers from playing soccer because that's not how it's supposed to be used. Um, so 
so there's that kind of history of exclusion, which is still being enforced in the ways that parks are currently being managed and shaping the ways that people are able to interact with their environment. So uh, kind of, I think a, a much more inclusive approach would be more place-based, more deliberative, and uh, taking into consideration many different um, elements of green space and ways that trees fit into that space rather than just trying to populate. Um, but that's a, yeah, it's a big question. Um, I just want to say, uh, is this on? Great. Jennifer, um, I just think it's brilliant how you're basically hijacking the reward pathway. <laughs> um, I, I think that's really crafty and it's interesting that it, application, um, it's been used as you're probably aware in, in learning, but also with online um, addiction treatments in a, in a more controversial fashion. Um, but I think, you know, if you ever want to look at the neural impact of that, let, let me know. It would be really fun to do. Um, Catherine, for the tree initiatives, is there long-term assessment? Do, do we know, like, what works and what doesn't? I mean, a lot of times you see, you go down the sidewalk and you see these dead trees in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, and, I mean, you know, what works, what doesn't? I mean. There, yeah, that's, that's the question. I think there are different people answer that in, in really different ways. I think, I mean, on the maintenance front, I think that's one really big reason that um, community members often push back against tree plantings, because in, in a neoliberal environment where the city is really cutting services, what I, one thing I found across Boston, Baltimore, and Philadelphia was that, you know, since the Reagan era, it was the P Parks Department and Public Works that were disproportionately getting cuts to their funding over time um, compared with revenue generating departments. And what that meant was that cities are kind of are having their hands tied in terms of actually uh, keeping the streets clean in, um, and taking and you know, adequately pruning trees and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a, a big, big problem. So there, was a, there has been a structural problem in the ways that the tree planting initiative has rolled out in that in general, Many cities have, have said, well, we can just give you a tree, you plant it and you take care of it, when actually the biggest costs are in establishing and maintaining it. So uh, that's, yeah, that's kind of an ongoing struggle that different cities are treating really differently. I'll say that an image change analysis between 2010 and 2020 by uh, David Nowak and Eric Greenfield of the Forest Service showed that the only cities to actually increase their tree cover were cities that were shrinking. So, so, you know, these programs coming out of mayor's offices are very much focused on, they don't want to know how many trees were lost during that time, right? They're only counting the trees that were planted. Um, so it really raises a lot of questions around the relationship between development and um, environmental protection. Um, and then, uh, like, the last thing I'd like to say is that most, uh, most programs, even if, they've really been planting a lot of trees, have really, really struggled to plant trees in neighborhoods with very low tree cover. You know, part of it is the, you know, kind of like engagement piece. Um, but a lot of it too is that the programs are focused so much on volunteers and the role of volunteers, which neighborhoods have dedicated environmental volunteers and this kind of time and space to be planting and maintaining trees, right? So, so, it's, so really active environmental groups are often in neighborhoods that already have a lot of tree cover, and so they're contributing to the expansion of tree cover in those neighborhoods. Um, but that's really a kind of structural problem. The only city that I know of that has really um, made big strides in addressing that is Philadelphia because what they did is they changed the, the resolution of how they're measuring progress rather than thinking about the, the percent of uh, tree cover changing on the city scale, they did it by neighborhood scale. So they want to have a certain percentage of tree by, uh, you know, in, per, by neighborhood um, to be a minimum level. We have one more question. Um, my question is primarily going to be for Jerry, but I, I want to ask a follow-up question to Catherine. Um, do you see any of uh, the response 
the, the people who don't want the trees. Uh, I mean, I know m in my childhood, when we'd move a place, my first thing my father would do would cut down all the trees because he wanted to grow food. Is that one of the, uh, it, is that a compelling factor in rejecting, um, I mean, maybe that's just the weirdness and craziness of my dad, but um, you know, I would, I know that Italian communities grow a lot of their own food. And so I wondered if that was one of the factors. Mm. If um, you want to speak to it or I do, whatever. Sure. Um, I, I haven't heard that specific uh, topic as much, but I think that in some cities, tree planting has really become associated with like white suburbanites. And it's just, it's just a, a very foreign, it's not, that, it's not that people don't like trees, but it's just so heavily associated with a demographic and as yet another uh, program that's being imposed on, on yeah. a community. So for example, in Boston, that didn't occur around tree planting, but it occurred around um, urban farming, actually. So Boston was trying to turn more of its vacant lots into potential um, farms. But the way, that the, the way that the city announced it in community meetings, unfortunately, left people in the, in the historically redlined neighborhoods um, interpreting it as, oh, so you think that the redlined neighborhoods, where, where the new farms would be, they, they ended up reading the initiative as saying that um, their, their worth was so low that the city wanted to put pigs and you know, farm animals next to them, right? And so, and so there's like, I think the controversies around different greening programs and the pushback is often so simplified into, oh, these people like just don't know they're, they're just not aware of sustainability. They're not aware of the benefits of trees or of growing your own food or that sort of thing. When the programs are really reflecting back to communities what their core relationships are. Yeah. I just wanted to make a quick comment related to that in simulations because so oftentimes like you see like a new urban project, maybe it's private, maybe it's public of some kind and the designs of those that are published very often look like that even if they're meant to be open, they look like they're for a particular demographic and that there's an exclusionary kind of aspect to them uh, that is, if not white, then of a certain socioeconomic class or something like that. And so that may be, you know, if somebody sees a tree-lined street, they might think, oh, great trees, or they might think, uh-oh, right? Um, that means that things are changing. And so how you would incorporate that into a simulation of some kind or how you would change a simulation uh, in relation to that would be interesting. I think we also forget trees are messy, right? Like, we forget that there's work associated with trees. Uh, and if I'm a middle-class person, I hire someone else to deal with that. And if I'm not, I'm fucked. So. The other... The other question I was going to ask Jerry was about the, in the data that you're gathering. I'm confused about the three categories. You had opportunistic and refugee and criminal. Where does, where do, and I'm also uh, currently obsessed with Haitians. Uh, where, where in those categories does a person fit when it's really a, like I've lost all the infrastructure of my life? I don't have a place to live anymore. I don't have electricity anymore. Um, and it's not political persecution, but it's just, is that a, is that a refugee or is that asylum or, or what, where does that fall? Yeah, I'm, I might jump in on, on that. Um, I, I, those are loose categories that I put together as um, you know, kind of broad classes. But yeah, I mean, there are folks that don't fit in any of those well, right? And um, we, but it's also with respect to uh, it, the, the international laws um, and speaking, like we have an obligation as we've signed on to the Geneva Convention as protocols to 
uh, uphold uh, asylum, international asylum laws. So we need to hear cases, and there's certain folks that qualify and certain that, that wouldn't. So that's kind of, yeah, that, yeah. that's what I would say. I would just say, like, also, there's lots of forms of relief uh, that people could apply for. So just, like I said, there's six different federal agencies that handle kind of immigration-related policies. The one we're focusing on is really more of not necessarily criminal, but court proceedings. And oftentimes there's, um, like, I think there's, like, 12 different types of cases that go through this process that fall into four different categories, such as removal, departure, expulsion, um, applying for, like, um, withholding of torture and uh, asylum, things of that nature. So people in that category are probably most likely actually going to be considered as opportunistic, which isn't necessarily a fair representation, but when we're talking about the EOIR and what we're modeling, they don't necessarily fall into that. They'd most likely be people who are being removed or deported if they don't have proper documentation. Um, and sometimes there are forms of relief that they can apply for, such as certain family um, ties sometimes give them opportunity to stay. However, it is very, they're very particular with what qualifications you can meet. And sometimes uh, immigrants will choose to voluntarily depart from the United States because it actually allows them a chance. There's like cases where judges kind of like encourage them to do that because it allows them to kind of re-enter the country, not necessarily legally, but if they're deported, they're banned from the country for up to 10 years. So it's definitely a very difficult kind of category to describe. Yeah, another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. That was, um, what, what, a, what an amazing conversation and just how things really sort of gelled. It was um, really up to you. We, we kind of had a brief conversation with everybody and this is what came of it. Um, so congratulations, everybody. That was wonderful. And um, we will now break for a few minutes and then um, I would say in about four, five minutes or so, we will reconvene for our next event, which is, um, on pedagogical justice, so uh, stay tuned. Thanks, thank you everyone.